Live from the Export Beer Garden Studios, you're listening to the BYC, where it's hard to believe the cricket is going on as we here in Auckland watch our cars float away like autumn leaves in a stream. But soldier on we shall, and there's much to cover, including the plucky black caps giving the Indians the odd slap to remind them you underestimate us at your peril. As always, we'll be covering off cricket from around the globe and domestically, plus a new segment on the BYC see great commentary moments and Dylan Cleaver happy underarm day mate oh thanks mate yeah momentous uh, day and um I think back obviously a couple of years ago when we had the one and only Martin Snid with us yes talking us through the underarm a great episode so uh, make sure you go back into your archives and dig that out listeners it's a it's a ripper Absolutely, and I believe uh, they're going to put a link in there for people to do just that, Dylan. Have a bit of a, a rerun. Pull forward, you mad bastard. How's life? Yeah, it's good. It's good. And uh, just confirming, uh, it's glad to see you that you are both safe and well, relatively. Uh, damp on the inside, perhaps, but uh, dry on the outside. Um, shit, it sucks up there in, in Auckland. Um, and uh, yeah, look, un- underarm day. Of course, the uh, Beige Brigade does have that ball and it's on loan at the New Zealand Cricket Museum. So if you're in the anywhere near the Basin Reserve, you can get down there and have a squiz at it that's in there for the next few years. So, yeah, underarm, as I have said before, as have others, uh, probably the greatest things that ever happened to New Zealand cricket. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, amazing. Totally, totally agree, mate. Well, let's hoe into it, fellas. Um, disappointing one-day series. Uh, we've already waxed lyrical about that. And I, I believe the feeling was in the, in the team uh, with this upcoming T20 series, Dylan, uh, that we were going to get absolutely pumped um, by the Indians, but the fellas not having a bar of it and putting up something of a fight in the series. Yeah, I think our, our rationale was sound. Yes. It's a reasonably experimental-looking uh, New Zealand squad, and playing in Indian conditions, we've, we haven't found easy even with our top names there. So uh, to come out in that first T20 in Ranchi and pretty convincingly put India to the sword... Surprised the hell out of me. I don't know if it surprised the hell out of you, Paul Ford. It, yes, it very much did. Um, look, I'm glad that all of the Indian cricket players that were playing in that match were listening to the BYC podcast and went out and got absolutely steamed to just stop caring and got blindsided by New Zealand in that first game, I think. Uh, they were a bit complacent. Obviously, you've been watching New Zealand play a bit too much on that tour. And, um, yeah, we're amazing. And I guess, you know, when you've got guys like Finn Allen and they get going, uh, and Devin Conway, he is sublime. And then you, uh, you're you going to give Daryl Mitchell something to hit off the final over. I think he got 27 off that final over in that match. And, um, you know, they stuffed up tactically, I think, the Indians by bowling too much. Um, they, they used their pace bowlers too much. You know, 120 we got off 10 of the overs in, in that first game. And then suddenly it's just been a, a spin-a-thon ever, ever since. And let's not forget the equivalent of a T20-50. Um, Mitchell sat in a bolt, a maiden in the power play in that first game. Unbelievable. Two for 11 of yeah. four overs. Well, I think it's fair to say that we were all taken aback by that result uh, and pleasantly um, surprised. Conway, as you mentioned there, Paul, sublime. Um, I, ju- I just, because uh, Santner, of course, the skipper at the moment, yeah. um, and, and I like his energy on the field. And, and he's obviously someone that's kind of relishing that opportunity, Dylan Cleaver. Um, and, he's, and he's obviously, too, a pretty tactically sound skipper. He, he seems very engaged. And add to that, he's bowling magnificently at the moment. Yeah, I think it helps. I, I would put him right up there in terms of T20 bowlers. He is, he's just got a great command of his uh, flight and variations. And it's funny you mentioned energy as skipper because he's not – I wouldn't put him in that character, uh, that category of high energy cricketers. No, normally, but I think the leadership has really added something to his game. With some players, that can take it away, right? They, yes. They uh, they worry a little bit too much about captaining and about strategy, about tactics, and the rest of their game suffers. I think Santon is a guy that actually needs that added responsibility, and I think it's, it's I think it's coming through in all facets of his game. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I and I think to a certain extent, Paul Ford, he's been rejuvenated uh, in a sense, and there, there's always this um, feeling for me when I think about uh, Santner and and you know that he hasn't quite fulfilled his potential. Um, You recall when he first came on the scene, uh, there were very high expectations of him, you know, and he he looked the goods. Um, But 
possibly, particularly when you think about the test game, hasn't gone on as we would have hoped. But but maybe this this new responsibility has given him a bit of a lift, given him a bit of vigour in his game. It, it does feel like that, yeah. Just the chance to, to spread his wings and try some stuff. And he's, you know, he's not not really a veteran in age, although he's no spring chicken. And he, you do sense that guys, you know, in that position who've played, particularly when they, I guess, they specialise in a format like he does. Um, you know, the, the, just the opportunity to, to try some stuff. And I know we haven't talked about the second game yet, but there was, I don't know if this was a joke, but apparently he said to Lockie Ferguson, do you think you could bowl some spin? Because he just decided, <laughs> we just need spin out here. And, and I think Lockie said, well, no, I don't, no, I don't. But that's, I mean, if, if that's a worked example of the kind of thinking that Santa's bringing to the table, I quite like it. Yeah, very much so. So an amazing first up win. Uh, and I see here the Lucknow groundsman was sacked. And I looked at that pitch and went, what the hell is going on there? It looked like it had some sort of virus issues. Um, New Zealand batting first, of course, getting 99. And I thought, oh, here we go. Uh, the, the expected result is on its way. But the Indians despite only being four wickets down, Dylan Cleaver, really struggled yeah. and only got there with the second to last ball of the match. They really made a meal of that. Yeah, so when New Zealand batted first, the first over was bowled by Hardik Pandya, the Indian captain, and it passed by without much um, event. I think Conway might have taken him over mid-wicket and it just looked like a normal game. First ball of the second over, they put their offy Washington Sundar on and it stopped in the pitch kicked up and turned sideways and I thought, oh, hello, hello. Obviously, they've got the message here after after Ranchi that there's not to be another pitch that offered the seamers anything. So it was – Hardik Pandya came out in the post-match and said, even though India won, he said, well, it was just a shocker of a pitch and unfortunately that's enough to get you sacked in, in India. Yeah, yeah, and one was, mistake uh, and you're <laughs> on your ass. The poor guy's down the road now. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it was a – very unusual pitch, the though, fair. Uh, it totally was. Sorry, Jace. Yeah, and it, I, there's some interesting stuff to see around this, like reading between the lines. So you're absolutely right that he got sacked, and presumably, you know, if you wanted to just draw a direct line, yep, it's because the Indians weren't happy with the pitch. But the the backstory is that the Indians went and had a look at that pitch three days before the match, and or well, the original pitch, and said, "We don't want to play on that. We don't want to play on a black soil pitch." Thanks. We want to play on a red soil pitch. And I think the groundsman was like, holy shit. Okay, well, I'll give it a crack. <laughs> so he went out and gave it a crack. And I think that he was probably sacked for that piece of information leaking out rather than the fact that he prepared a bad pitch that India happened to win on. So, uh, yeah, pretty interesting one. And when the highest partnership in a match, I had a, in the match, I had a quick look, was the, the unbeaten 31 at the end from um, Surya Kumar Yadav and Hardik Pandya. And our best was 21. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. And I, I think, um, yeah, great to see Bracewell uh, still being a bit of a menace with with the ball, handy with the bat, but a menace with the ball. And um, yeah, Ish Sodi seems to be the one that's just a little bit out of sorts, but maybe he's due. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned the beast there because, you know, we've been talking on previous podcasts about will he develop as a spin bowling option, and I believe that development is taking place, uh, Dylan. I believe he's yep. getting better and. And obviously, and it's an obvious thing to say, but the more exposure he gets at the top level is going to, only going to benefit his game, and he's showing some capabilities. Yeah, I'd pump the handbrake a little bit on this particular game, though, because I could have taken wickets on that pitch. If well... You, if you, he said he's a little oh, bit behind oh, because he's a wrist oh. spinner, so, so he doesn't have quite the same accuracy as the finger spinner. But if you're even a half-decent schoolboy... Uh, finger spinner, you could bowl well on that pitch, but he is developing into a genuine white ball option um, with the ball, and obviously a, a wonderful clean hitter down the order at seven, and perhaps even higher. I'd like to see him float a little bit more in the order. Sure, but I still, I mean, I, I keep going back to this. I still think if you're going into a test match with Bracewell, your number one spinner, like New Zealand did in England, I think that's a little bit of an indictment on where our game is at the moment in terms of spin bowling. Sure. Uh, now, looking at the final game to decide this series, fellas, 2.30am, uh, I believe, tomorrow morning. Yep. Uh, w what are your thoughts, Paul Ford? How do, you, how do you see it playing out? Well, for all of our Indian listeners, you know, I'd say New Zealand's got absolutely no chance whatsoever yeah. of winning this match. No, look, I, had a, I had a quick look at the stats. 
Geez, it's going to be tough. Let's just say that. Yeah, India have played 177 matches across all formats in the last 10 years. They've won 125 and only lost 42 of them. They've played 55 series and they've won 47 of those and drawn six. Um, that's bilateral series, all formats at home past 10 years. So really, really hard. As I said, you know, I think Ish Sodi's due. So I'm thinking it's going to be a, a big game for him. And surely... Surely it won't be luck now 2.0. It can't spin as much as it did in Ahmedabad. So I think that we're in with a sniff. I'd probably give us a 30% chance of winning and a 70% chance against, to be honest. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Playing at the uh, biggest cricket arena in the world and one of the biggest capacity grounds of any sort in the yes. world. It's a pretty amazing place. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Lockie Ferguson's home ground in the IPL. So a little bit of local knowledge there. Perhaps he will bowl a bit of spin. Yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, well, let's say uh, let's hope. Uh, fingers crossed that the boys are able to take it over the line. And I, I think you're right, Re uh, Ish Sodi there, Paul, because he he was showing he, he, talking about rejuvenation. He looked a rejuvenated bowler in Pakistan for me. He looked like he was bowling really well and in terrific form. And he's just you're right, gone off the boil a bit. But we uh, anticipate that game with some eagerness tomorrow morning, and we'll be reporting on the next podcast. The result of that. Now, now the highlight of the summer, let's be honest, fellas. Uh, England are here. Yep. And I am fizzing at the prospect of these of this test series, and she's going to be a doozy. Uh, how do you see it playing out, Dylan Cleaver? Because... Match abandoned can, without a ball ball. Yeah, well, let's just hope the bloody... <laughs> let's, let's hope the weather goddamn... <laughs> Behaves itself, Jesus. Yeah. Um, because I know that you tend to take the pessimistic view and sort of get no, down no. on the boys and, you know, get all Dunedin and Otago sort of knives in the back type stuff. <laughs> but I, I, I rate our chances. I rate our chances. Yeah. And they'll be looking for redemption after our last series in England. Yeah, I think they definitely do well. Um, England have ensconced down in Millbrook, I believe. Uh, so they will just be on the... Pinot Noirs, they're yeah. playing golf every day. Uh, Beef Wellingtons for dinner. They, by the time they get to the mount, they're going to be just fully hung over and, you know, faced with conditions like this, I hope. You know, like the Borneo rainforest, as you say, with a little bit of green tinge <laughs> in the wicket, Southie nipping it away. Um, obviously, sorry, no Trent Bolt, but um, Matt Henry... Hitting the strings, jigging oh, away. Oh. I'd say New Zealand won the toss back first thing and all out for 64 a la Eden Park. <laughs> uh, when, when was that, 2016? Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Only, the only sort of downside of that, though, Paul Ford, when you think about it, because, you know, you imagine because of all the rain we've had, there will be a bit of a green tinge to the wickets. Um, but of all the sides in uh, world cricket, England mm. probably the most capable of coping with that, given where they come from themselves. Yeah, look, I think I think that's right. And you, we talk about our wily um, pace duo of Bolt and Southie. Of course, it's been split up for this series, unfortunately, or at least for the first test. I don't know if we know if Bolt's available for the second. But yeah, look, any time that um, we get swing and seam uh, and they walk out with Anderson and Broad, yeah, uh, pretty useful, pretty useful. And uh, yeah, look, I was just looking at their squad, just reminding myself. So they don't have Mark Wood. So that's that's good. So they don't have that sort of... I guess, good extreme pace. Um, and they don't have uh, – Joffre's not coming. They don't have the young, the young child leggy. prodigy leg spinner, nah. Ram, Ram Ahmed. He's not he's not coming over. No Bester, of course. No no Jocelyn Butler. So, you know, they're still a pretty handy team. They've just been – a few of them have just been given a bit of a hiding over in South Africa. So hopefully they're a touch out of form. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think they've – I think I just had a quick look. looks like they've got a warm-up game against the New Zealand 11 – a week today, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how they go on that one and get a bit of a taster ahead of that pink ball test match at the Mount. Yeah, nice. Uh, just just for the listeners out there, by the way, the ACC will be covering, uh, doing the commentary of, of those test matches. Uh, there's been a bit of conjecture too about Kyle Jamison. Oh, I yes. researched this deeply um, because I was told to. <laughs> um, and from what I can understand, fellas, he is back playing cricket. Uh, of course, he's had that seven-month layoff. The selectors are being extremely cautious. He played a bit of club cricket, got pumped a little bit, but, you know, the, that's neither here nor there. Uh, and I think he played a Super Smash game, uh, but I think Dylan Cleaver, in terms of the England series, probably a bridge too far this point. at this point because 
as I say, he's been off for seven months. You don't want to rush him back in, and then he blows out again in the you know the first day of the first Test match. Fair enough. Yeah, so I think that's where he's at, Paul Ford. But you may have more up to date knowledge. No, I was just going to say he he was at the at the basin last week and bowled uh, ten overs, so I guess got through that safely. So he looks like he's coming back into things. Um, gosh, we need him, don't we? Without Bolt there, I think he's he's shaping as a even more important um, guy for us, of course. Yeah, well... If you were convinced, can I put a hypothetical to you? If you're convinced that his body will hold up, would you select him even if you're not convinced that he's got the skill level back up to where he was pre-injury? Would you let him work his way into it in a test match situation or would, or would that be yes. crazy? You would? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I think... No, it, it, I, I no, think I it's would. one of those scenarios. <laughs> it's one of those scenarios. It's like right getting on the bike again, and 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 the motor function and the muscle memory and all that sort of stuff would come back relatively quickly. I don't think he'd be starting from scratch uh, if he's physically fit and strong and so forth. Yeah, I chuck him in there. You probably don't need the fine skills to ride a bike again, though, like you do. Yeah, but in terms of scene position and. But he hasn't forgotten all those skills. You know what I mean, Paul Ford? I mean, you disagree, obviously. Uh, no, it was an interesting question. I, I mean, I must say, when Dylan sort of started going down that road, I was like, yeah, of course I'd pick him, of course I'd pick him. But, you know, you'd want him to get be in that New Zealand 11 game, I think, and get through a bunch of overs there, ma- managed. Yeah, I don't know. I, th- I think I would probably be pretty happy, you know, Southey, Wagner, Henry for that first test match. But, um, yeah, look, if Jamison's, if Jason assesses him in the nets and um, through all of his contacts and is happy with him, with his fitness, um, I'm, I'll be stoked to see him in there. Don't get me wrong. Oh, look, I've been working with him in the massage room uh, quite extensively, so I've got a, quite an intimate knowledge of Kyle's body. He's, look, he's in pretty good shape, uh, to be fair. He's a good-looking fella did too, trapped, but I mean... Did, did he get trapped out west during the floods? Yeah, Jason? he did. <laughs> so I gave him a bit of a rub down and some deep heat there, and uh, I think he'll be all right. Now, listen, just on the test cricket... Waiting! Waiting! Ricky Ponting made some interesting comments, which I'd like to point out there. Now, the gap between wealthier and less wealthy cricket nations is widening and will contribute to test cricket being less competitive, therefore devaluing international cricket. The gap immediately expedites the flight of talent away from bilateral international cricket as the less wealthy cricket nations are disadvantaged in funding their professional, domestic and national retainer contracts and they won't be able to sustain investment in cricket and player development, infrastructure and administration. Your thoughts, Dylan? Well, he's dead right, but I suspect someone wrote that for him. Oh, right, you're saying he's not capable of writing something so eloquent? Ricky Ponting using the word expedites? Yeah, that's true. Unless someone else has knowledge, I say It can't have been someone in Australia either. It was probably (laughs) like an English journal. A a Mike Nicholas or... or, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or maybe Gideon Haig might might have been able to. But I think he makes a fair point, Paul Ford. Yeah, look, I think it's this point that we've been talking about for a while, which is that... The, the, the countries like New Zealand, like Sri Lanka, like the West Indies that can't afford to pay their their players, I guess, market rate salaries for, to, for being superstar international cricketers or even quite good ones, they are the most likely to be picked off by these overseas leagues. And ultimately, that means that the, the second tier nations are going to become increasingly weak, which I, it's a, it, is, it does look like it's going that way unless there's some sort of intervention. Now, it seems crazy and I, it's not too late, I, I don't think, but it seems crazy for that to just continue unabated and for the money not to be redirected to solve that problem. Um, there is money there, it's just where it's being uh, directed. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it's a very eloquent point, even if it was written down by somebody else. Well, speaking of money, uh, let's talk about the women's uh, IPL. Uh, franchises sold for a total of 800 and 91 million New Zealand dollars. That's staggering stuff, Dylan Cleaver. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's probably a 43rd, I think I saw somewhere, of what paid for the men's fr- franchises. But it doesn't, I mean, we're talking two different sports effectively there. It's a momentous day for women's cricket. I don't think it's going to have a huge impact. Oh, I, it's going to have yeah, a massive yeah. impact. Surely. I don't think we can overstate that. And there's actually really generous allocation of 
overseas players for each of those teams. I think you can have five in the playing 11. I'm not sure how many you can have in the squad. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities. You can argue, and I, I, I'm not sure if we did last week or if I did it on my newsletter, The Bounce, which you should all subscribe to, but I do think that initially it's going to just funnel, most of that money will go towards the elite of the elite, who are already getting gigs around the world, your Sophie Devines, your Susie Bates, um, your Beth Mooney's, all, all the uh, Melly Kears, all the good players will probably initially be there, but it just does, it's going to show a pathway. Totally. And, it, it, yeah, I, I genuinely think it's a game changer. It is a massive game changer, <laughs> and, and it just it's just such an attractive thing for young uh, female players, Paul Ford, to get, you know, to see that it's been taken seriously and there's real opportunity there. Oh, totally. You know, that, and, you know, that, that maths of, you know, $180 million for a franchise. Uh, there's a TV deal that's been locked down 900. Uh, sorry, that's 180 million, I think over five years, um, you know, and you've got squads. I think, you know, Dylan, you're talking about the overseas players and, I saw I saw a stat which said there were eighteen. There are going to be eighteen players in each squad. I think the auction's coming up in March. Eighteen players in each squad. So and salary cap per squad of two point three million. So an average salary of one hundred and twenty six thousand dollars. As you say, if the IPL is anything to go by, that will be tilted very much in favour of the the rock star all rounders, if you like. Put it in, put, and so you know you're looking at Sophie Devine, Susie De, Susie Bates, Mealy Kerr. I mean. Um, I saw some speculation that they're probably in sort of 300 grand, 400 grand for, you know, what, a month's work, something like that, two months' work. Good um, shit. Absolutely mm. massive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is massively significant and, and a great boost for the women's game and, and well past time, actually. Now, let's get into the domestic game, uh, the Super Smash Canterbury on top there with 20, Otago on top as well with 20, Central Districts 18, Northern Districts 18, Wellington 16 and Auckland 12. Uh, are they officially out of the running now, Auckland? Auckland are. Yeah. yeah. Um, CD have but she's the, pretty tight, Dylan Cleaver. Uh, CD of wet the beard coming in. Um, they they could have, you know, dribbled their way into the playoffs, but they've lost three in a row, so they're in grave danger now. Um, Canterbury are somehow at the top. I, I, look, it might be my natural bias here, but I don't think they've even looked that great. Um Otago are probably the surprise package. Well, for me, they are anyway. Not well, you mean because they won some games? <laughs> yeah, they've won half their games so far. I don't know what the hell's going on, but yeah. Yeah, your thoughts, Paul Ford? Oh, I was just going to say, just overall, it's a good comp, isn't it? You know, yeah, you've got it is. Every t- when you sit down and watch it, you're just not quite sure. You know, Auckland are bottom of the table, but they're not a very fun team to play. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's something some, there's something to be said for a competition that is uh, even, and you're just not quite sure what the hell's going to happen. Wellington a little bit the same, I think, but like uh, CD, it's sort of riding high, and you take a couple of their superstars out, and they've they've fallen away a bit. So uh, yeah, I, I, it's tough to pick a winner of this one. I, I think. Yeah, wouldn't it be lovely if it was a tiger? We could really rub Dylan's face in it. That'd yeah, great. totally. It would be so good. In the women's game, uh, as discussed in previous podcasts, Wellington just running away with it and just seem, you know, light years ahead of everyone else. The Canterbury uh, side on 24 and Otago and Auckland uh, on, the, on the bottom of the heap there on 18. Well, actually, yeah. the district's teams are, but I cut them off because yes. they're nowhere to be seen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it seems a fait accompli to me, uh, Dylan Cleaver. Yeah, although women's T20 now, um, which is what I was alluding to last week, I, I think the end of this competition is going to bear very little resemblance to the start of it because all the best players are got, have, yeah, going to be in South Africa. So it's a, it's not quite as closed shop as I um, as you probably suspect when you look at that table. But uh, I mean, again, it's going to take a very good team to beat Wellington. Are, are the Australian players sticking around for the playoffs, Paul? I think they are. I think that's part of the theory is that they've sort of been brought in as a as a um, safety net for the for the big guns heading overseas. That that's how I think that is working. But uh, I'll keep an eye on that. Hey, let's go to the Ford Trophy. Uh, Central Districts on top there. Northern Districts on twenty two, two points behind. Canterbury twenty one, Otago sixteen, Wellington fourteen, Auckland twelve. What's going on with Auckland at the moment, Dylan? Well, they had that um, terrible start to the summer where they have, didn't have a home ground. Yes. 
and kind of made in underwater. God knows what it's like now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's probably a it's giant a, a, yeah. sinkhole. So yeah, I'd imagine so. so. Yeah. And actually Eden Park out of Oval has just been hammered this last week too. So they haven't had a home ground. They haven't been very good when they've played. Um, look. Again, the surprise for me, there's a couple of games today actually in the Ford Trophy ongoing as we speak, but again, the surprise for me is Otago in such an elevated position there in fourth. God, just really hoeing in today, Paul, Paul Ford. I mean, what's going on? I mean, I, I call him a bit of a pessimist, but Jesus, he's sticking the boot in today. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm going to go down to the base and I'm going to have a chat to a couple of the players this afternoon and just point this out and let's yeah, really totally. start something up here so that Dylan gets a bit of correspondence from the south. The good guys are on top, though, in the Ford Trophy. Yeah, looking very good. Will Young averaging 98.5 this season. Guys like Shmulian, I think, is the top run scorer with 324. Ravindra has nearly got 300 runs for Wellington. Um, Nick Kelly, for who was an Otago, uh, actually he might have been an ND and an Otago guy. He's now in Wellington, got 287. Here's a little interesting thing I want to point out to you, okay? And this... Like, I get this a lot on my text machine. Um, Your text machine? On my text machine. I grew up <laughs> I grew up with CD cricketers. We've always had a bit of a chip on our shoulder about Canterbury getting inside running. For like, the, the old joke was that if you made the Canterbury team, you'd made the New Zealand team, basically. But the top wicket taker in the Ford Trophy is a guy called Brett Randell, who um, he may have come from Northern Districts, actually, but he's playing for CD now. And he's got 16 wickets, and his four trophy economy rate this season is 3.51 and over, which is an outstanding. And just as a comparison, I looked at his career figures up against Henry Shipley. And Henry Shipley could end up being a fine cricketer for New Zealand. I've got no idea at the moment. I mean, I, I expressed a few doubts about him, but that's, that's unfair when you're debuting in Pakistan. Yes. And, your, and your next tour is India. We, we need to see him in home conditions before I make any judgments. But, you know, Randall's record's better. And he's a year older yeah. than Shipley. So I, I, I get where these people come from when they say that you, know, you play, there's a couple of associations you play for in New Zealand where you, it just seems like you have a little bit of an inside track. Waiting! Waiting! Yeah, well, I mean, you could argue that probably with the All Blacks too. Canterbury sides just, you know, seem to get a bit of a run there. But what are your thoughts on that, Paul Ford? Yeah, the Brett Randell one is is quite interesting. He was, I think he was top wicket taker in the Plunkett Shield last year as well. So it's not like he's just having a – and you know, you've alluded to it with some of those numbers too, Dylan. It's not like he's had a fluke this, this season. He's, uh, he's a pretty consistent performer. So, yeah, I – so it's hard to argue with. I don't know why he's can he, – maybe he's going to get a shot soon. Surely. Hey, read the England Test Series. It's about to come out. Do we just do we just interchange Young with Nichols now? Just get it done? Ooh. Just get it done, fellas, shouldn't we? Uh, just, just swap him over. Happy with that. I mean, fellas. I mean, come on. He's yep. in top form. Yep. And he's And he's – him coming in at number five, Dylan Cleaver. Oh, hey, I'll, hey. I'll, I'll do it in a heartbeat, but – they were going to use the argument he hasn't played Red Bull cricket for a long oh, time, aren't yeah. they? That's what they're going to say. I'd just do it. Pull the trigger. They need me in the selection panel. Hey, Paul Ford, it's time for News or Ruse. Yeah, it is. And just a reminder, we've changed formats. We're now running, we're playing for the Oi Hoi Cup trophy, which is the worst trophy ever seen in cricket. And there's been some shockers. So this is from the 2018 Pakistan versus New Zealand series. I went down and swapped it uh, at the Cricket Museum for the underarm ball. So now I've got that, and I've literally got it here, and I'll be posting it to whoever wins News or Ruse today. Three bits of news. There'll be something funky, something deliberately wrong with one of them. You boys better tell me what it is, otherwise I'm going to win. Number one, former Pakistan coach Mickey Arthur is likely to take up the men in green's coaching responsibilities again, but this time with a twist. Arthur will be working with the team mostly in an online capacity via Zoom and will only join them in person for the upcoming One Day International World Cup in India. Arthur will continue double dipping and working for Derbyshire County Cricket Club as their full-time coach. In the meantime, 
the PCB will appoint Arthur's assistant, who will be in charge of the team on the ground in his absence. Of course, Arthur has uh, coached South Africa, Australia, Pakistan and Sri Lanka on the international stage. Uh, punchable face corner. The world's top-ranked test batter, Manas Labashain, has shared a photo of the bag he's packed for the upcoming tour of India, and it's chock full of coffee, bagged filter coffee. Labashain, who's often claimed he is obsessed with coffee as much as he is with cricket, has appointed himself the head barista of the Australian cricket team and says he loves the process and art of making coffee as much as drinking it. The coffee that the 28-year-old has packed is the Run Club. Yep, punishingly, it's his new and personal brand of coffee launched last year. Labashain allegedly consumes 15 to 20 coffees per day. Makes sense. And told The Guardian... <laughs> that the most useful object he had was his coffee machine, the Marzocco Linear Mini. So there you go. Uh, that's not a paid endorsement. And number three, RIP Frank Cameron, former New Zealand Test cricket bowler and selector Frank Cameron's died in Christchurch, age 90. He took 22 wickets and just 19 appearances for New Zealand between 1961 and 1965 with his right arm outswing. His best test display was against Pakistan at Eden Park. Took four for 36 in the first innings, five for 34 in the second, in a low-scoring draw, bowling first change behind Richard Collins and Dick Motts. He was Deputy Prince of Otago Boys for ages, got an MBE. It's a great story that John Reid uh, told stuff, actually, which talked about his career and a couple of things that stu stu uh, stuck in his mind. One was how Cameron bowled without a murmur against Rhodesia on New Zealand's 1961 62 South African tour, despite a most painful minor operation on the morning of the last day. Quote, in the dressing room, Frank stripped to shower and it was seen his socks were saturated with blood. He must have been in agony. If, if ever I had admiration for a man's silent fortitude, it was then. Great stuff, Tough mate. as old boots. Well, it makes sense about Manus Labashane, doesn't it? Yeah. 15 cups of coffee. No wonder he's a nut job on the field. Right. Jumping all over the place. And I'm sorry if you love your coffee and you, you're a bit of an aficionado. Filter coffee? Don't think so. <laughs> don't think so in, now. In India. Like, don't, they do coffee in India. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's shocking. Hey, whose turn is it? Well, it's my turn to go first. Can I, um, just on that first story, what were the international teams that you said Mickey Arthur coached? South Africa, Australia, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Yeah, that's correct. Um Oh, shit. It's, I like how seriously you take this, Dylan. It's bad form that you're going to do it for an obit. You shouldn't have a ruse in an obit, but I'm going to go story three and say it was Kings High, not Otago Boys, where he's deputy principal. I was going to go story three as well and say that uh, one of the bowlers that you mentioned that he bowled with, he didn't actually bowl with. Well done, you guys. Share the belt. Uh, I did. I did go to the dark corners of uh, of uh, an obit uh, ruse, Dylan, but not too bad. Cameron took sixty two wickets in nineteen appearances yeah. ah. for New Zealand, not just twenty two. He was. He was. He was pretty bloody good. Average lower than thirty. He was uh, pretty good during the sixties. He was credited with getting Richard Hadley. Um, it's impossible to think of it now, but Richard Hadley was a really inconsistent, fast tearaway away when he started for New Zealand. And Frank Cameron was credited with a, getting him on, on track by getting Hadley to move the ball forward in his fingers more when he bowled. Right, okay. And it all went uphill. Or, is that the right term? Everything went well from then on in. Yeah, I know what you're saying. An upward trajectory. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uphill career, sounds like yeah. it was tedious and painful. Yeah. Uh, but now we've got a, a, a bit of music here for you, and this is Pakistan's Safraz Ahmed singing, uh, singing skills at the wedding night of opening batter Shan Masood. <laughs> Not a bad voice, actually. I don't know if the recording does not credit me. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of background sort of banter going on, which sort of distracted. 
Obscure players of the 90s. Yes, so moving up country to Canterbury, and as I might have mentioned before, it's very hard to find an obscure Canterbury player because they all end up playing for New Zealand. But I did find one called Brad Doody, a aggressive left-hand opener from the Canterbury country, I think maybe from the Rangiora area. Anyway, he played 25 first-class matches, averaged 24.95 with 100. He played 53 list A matches, so that's not an insignificant career, actually. Perhaps he's not obscure, um, but averaged 27.58. He also scored 100 there. Um, known as an Oxford Cricket Club legend, he has the record there for scoring 192 against Ohoka. So we're talking Oxford Canterbury, obviously, not Oxford Blues over yes. in uh, England. And as recently as 2019 was turning out for the Oxford slash Rangiora, which I assume is a merged club now. Um, I believe he's an accountant by trade and a part owner of the Allett Reeves firm in Canterbury. Great stuff, Dylan Cleaver. You're welcome. Great stuff. Now listen, before we get into a Cricket Violence Corner, Paul Ford, uh, this was from Fraser via Instagram. How on earth was the Michael Clark debacle not brought up in the pod this week? I thought it would at least sneak its way into Cricket Violence Corner. Make it right, says Fraser. Paul Ford's Cricket Violence Corner. Yeah, brought to you by Fraser this week. Thank you, Fraser, for that direct uh, feedback into my uh, DMs on Instagram. I appreciate that. Uh, Australian cricket legend Michael Clark was slapped in the face by his girlfriend Jade Yarbrough during a furious late night row in a public park. The couple were holidaying in Queensland with Jade's sister Jasmine and her partner, Australian TV presenter Carl Stefanovic. But the trip turned sour while Clark and Jade were having dinner at a beachside restaurant with accountant Anthony Bell. Not sure if Brad Duty was there as well. Footage obtained by the Daily Telegraph showed the pair becoming embroiled in a raging argument that was reportedly about Clark's smoking hot ex-girlfriend, fashion designer, Pip Edwards. Uh, lots of swearing, and then um, uh, Michael Clark uh, responding to allegations about infidelity, uh, swearing on his daughter's life, saying, baby, you're wrong, baby, you're wrong, I swear on my life, it's not true, it's not true. And then uh, Stefan Ovik's wife, Jasmine, intervened, pulling her sister away, and then Jasmine told Clark, get away with Carl, go with Carl. Jade stepped in to, to defend Stepanovic and slapped Clark in the face, called him a piece of shit and said, don't you effing speak to him. And then Clark finished by telling Jade, don't ever talk to me again. So, Fraser, you know, we've brought it up. I actually watched it. I did think about it for Cricket Violence Winner, but it's it's quite grim seeing people screaming. Clark was hobbling around. I actually felt uncomfortable actually watching out all right. it. All right. Did you see it, Jase? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah well, and, and I'll be honest with you, fellas, that happens every day out West Auckland. You know what I mean? There's those sort of old occasions all the time. Stop it, Daryl! Leave him alone, Daryl! Just leave him, Daryl! I mean, Christ, it happens every bloody day out west. Hey, now finally... Um, it does, I was just going to say, it does seem like Michael Clark has turned into a bit of a caricature, sort of like Kanye West of cricket over in Australia. Like, he's just... Yes hard to take seriously, and so I don't know how much sympathy his uh, apologies have engendered, but he has lost work, he's lost commentary gigs, but he's probably going to pick up a tabloid book and all sorts of other uh, horrendous stuff on the other side of the equation. So that's life. Who wants to be you, Michael Clark? Good you on you, you, mate. Hey, let's get into your correspondence. Incidentally, Paul Ford, if people want to get in touch with us, what do they do, mate? Uh, flick us an email to byc at beigebrigade.co.nz or slide into the DMs of the Alternative Commentary Collective or the Beige Brigade on Facebook or the Gram. Topper Correspondence of the Week, brought to you by Leader NZ's Lasagna Topper. This is from Muzz. I will just take one part of his correspondence, I think, fellas. And looking at Jack Leach, it seems to me that part of the reason he has been as successful is twofold. England plays more often than New Zealand, but they also play him and give, have given him time to develop, and he's become a pretty reliable performer. I get that New Zealand pitchers aren't exactly spinner-friendly, but if he was a Kiwi, would he be in a similar position to Ajaz Patel, says Muzz Dylan Cleaver? Yes, yeah, he would be. And I actually I rate Ajaz Patel as a better spinner than Jack Leach, and if Leach plays those that test series in New Zealand, which I assume he is, I think he's the one they should target. But yeah, I, I think he's dead right. They've, they've handled him really well. He 
he's obviously um, a confident guy now where he probably wasn't when he first started. And, you know, who knows what we would have had with AJ's Patel if he'd been given that same uh, long leash. That yeah. Jack Leach, I, I, uh, and I, I'm kind of sort of liking it in a way to uh, Matt Henry. Uh, you know, I know they're not the same type of bowlers, but just being given a decent run to sort of develop. And there's nothing worse for your confidence, particularly as a spinner, when you you pick for a test match, you play, you bowl for two or three overs, get pumped, and they take you off. I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't do anything for a player. You've got to persist. Where's Matt Henry from again? Canterbury. Oh, where's AJ's Patel from? Wellington. Oh, no. conspiracy theorist <laughs> Dylan Cleaver. Your thoughts, Paul Ford? Palmy. He's from CD. Yeah, look, I, I was, oh, CD, yes, he yeah, is. CD, Sorry, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah look, I, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think most people would find it absolutely staggering that the guy that can take 10 wickets in an innings anywhere, anytime, is just not selected. How could that person not be selected in your team or pretty much every squad that you play, um, you know, select for test cricket? It, it sort of doesn't make make a hell of a lot of sense. And, you know, I, I agree with you, Jace. Like, there's that long-term strategy around uh, developing someone who's got the confidence, who's built into the fabric of the team. Um, and, you know, if that means he gets pumped for a few runs on um, green seamers when we're rolling teams for, you know, 65, who cares? Um, you know, I don't think selecting AJS Patel in some of the test matches in New Zealand over the past few years would have affected the results. So, yeah, yeah because look, I, I would love to see his development. You know, because... Um you know, we, we're seeing the development of Michael Bracewell in, in a show he bowled well in Pakistan as well. And I, I kind of got the vibe from um, Patel over in Pakistan, Dylan, that he'd lost a bit of confidence. Yeah, I certainly think that. But he's lost a lot of cricket too. And he's, he's not young either now. No. So, you know, I just think he's probably going to end his career of being that guy that just wasn't handled particularly well. Yeah. Which, which is a real shame. Hey, and well, I, I should note, note actually before we go that I love visiting the South Island. Otago and Canterbury are some of my favourite holiday spots. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't so be going down there personal. too soon now after the comments you made in this podcast, Dylan Cleaver. Hey, how's the bounce going, mate? Yeah, it's going really well. Um, DylanCleaver.sudstat.com. Uh, get on there and register and you'll get some um, goodness dropped into your inbox at least twice a week, usually three or four. Good on you, mate. Hey, well, thanks for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Make sure you download us, give us a rating, and uh, we'll be back same time, same place next week. Until then, we'll see you later. Thank you.